Hello and welcome to Cinema Subculture, the channel where we discuss everything strange, obscure and downright messed up in the world of movies. My name's Gary. And I'm Simon. What film are we going to be discussing this evening? Nymphomaniac, a 2014 film directed by Lars von Trier. The film stars Charlotte Gainsbourg as Joe, who is found abandoned in the street by Seligman, a lonely intellectual played by Stellan Skarsgård. Seligman takes her back to his home to let her recover, and Joe recounts her life as an infomaniac. This is the director's cut we're going to talk about as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we, we first saw this film together. Well, we did. Not the director's cut, but the, the, the theatrical cut, as it were. We saw this together at the cinema. Uh, this is my first kind of encounter with the director's cut. Um, to be honest, I found it a little bit difficult to remit, like, kind of... There's a few bits I don't I feel that weren't there in the theatrical, so but I wasn't necessarily able to discern um, exactly what the new bits were, if that makes sense. But um, but yeah, right. Have you oh, seen the film since then? No, no. That's wow. The yeah. I've seen it um, since then. Uh, yeah. But yeah, do you want to go ahead with? I so the director's cut is a uh, twenty-seven minutes longer. Right. This is a inconsistent rambling even messy at times, but I still think it's very rich. It's a rich, compelling experience. Uh, it remains that way. It was a, a bit of a puzzle because, well, it's a bewildering film in a sense. It's one that um, I didn't quite take to the first time I seen it. It was a bit of a disappointment. And um, I went on the Film Jive podcast back in 2014. Uh, I just listened back to that with Zach. And uh, I was quite scathing about it. Uh, back then but it's curious because it's probably now the Von Trier film that I've seen most right. um, despite its length I don't know it's one that always draws me back because um, it's one that like, I can't go get quite get my head around um, I think it's it's very nature it's, it's messiness there's something kind of compelling about it that's a little um I don't know. It's obviously extremely vast. The it's like a four hour. The the standard cut's four hours. It's five and a half of the director's cut. Um, so it's um, yeah. Said, sorry, guys. To jump yeah. In, we said we're just doing volume one for this. Right. Episode. Okay. I don't know if we've said that. No. Right. Like that's we right. That. Yeah, we're just going to look at part one of the director's cut we'll on this episode. The, the next episode. Um. So yeah, I think going into this, um, I was a like Last One is one of my favourite directors, um, and I think his peak was Antichrist and Melancholia. So I had big uh, expectations of this film uh, when it came out, and I think at the time, um, the sort of media campaign was quite extreme in the sense that oh, what are we in for here? Yeah. Especially coming off of Antichrist, which I would put over there one of the most disturbing cinematic experiences uh, that I've ever had. Um, so I was expecting, oh, and the extreme auteur, Lars von Trier, is going even further. Um, and one of the takeaways from it is almost its kind of vanilla nature. Uh, it's quite passive. Um, even the one the director's cut that we do get more uh, explicit um, graphic sex scenes. Um, it wasn't quite the film that maybe I was expecting. Um, but, and also, uh, I think um, it's quite a switch in style, in a sense, from his two previous films, which were quite, had a grandness, had a, a unity. Um, uh, Von Trier normally deals in stories which are quite um, we normally get a, a, sort of a, a straight character arc which is, ends in some kind of revelation um, it's normally tied up uh, he normally explores some kind of idea and the contradictions of an idea and um, takes that to, to its extreme uh, peak in this film um, it's basically flat we don't, it feels like a novel, it feels like um, 
one of my problems with it I had the first time was that it's just like, okay, we're just getting more and more. Uh, what is it building to? And we do, we do get a climax at the end, but I feel like that climax could have came at any point in the film. You could have cut half it out and stuck that climax on the end and it would have been fine. But I don't think that's a problem anymore. Um, I still think it's not his best, but I think it's a very good piece of work. And it's... Um, uh, I'd almost say, like, that there's bits that don't work, but I think that's part of its charm. It's got, a, it's got the messiness is almost built in. Because uh, I think the style of the film, we get a lot of a mixture of style and tone kind of mashed together that's quite in, inconsistent, but I think intentionally. It's almost kind of a punk collage thing we've got going on because I've got, uh, you've got a mess of aspect ratios. Uh, you've got stock footage. You've got colour and black and white. You've got a mixture of pop music, classical. Um, you've got um, all the different actors playing different parts. Um, you've got text, you've got images. So I think all that kind of messy, just collage style, actually, ultimately, is what gives the film something, a distinctive character, even though if it's not a complete work um, as maybe uh, Antichrist. But um, so yeah, I'll throw it back to you. But uh, it's one that is that's um, stayed with me. Um, it's, I think it's a powerful piece of work, even though it's not entirely uh, it's not entirely successful. When you're talking, just to clarify, when you're talking about the, the climax, you're you talking about part to volume one. Oh, sorry. Or... Well, that that's no. the kind of trouble here. I yeah. uh, I was trying to talk about the film with the, mm. the, the, the I was meaning the climax at the part two, but. Yeah, because that's something I was giving a bit of thought to when, when we decided to cover this as two parts. Um, you know, after watching Volume 1, I haven't watched Volume 2 yet. Um, even though that, that, it was quite difficult for me to stop, to be honest with you, which I, th I, I thought was is a testament to the film. Mm. Um, but I wondered, you know, does it, this work as a as a film on its own? I don't think it does really. Um, it definitely has a, a finish point that's a kind of... Um, it, it, it feels like a to be continued moment. Yeah, really. it's, it's definitely it's got like a kind of full stop kind of thing to it, or it's more of an, an ellipsis. Um, but yeah, um, so what to say about this film? So I, 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 as soon as as soon as we started, I started watching it again. I just remember sitting in the cinema and that long opening that of silence and, mm. and the dripping and and like remember like, i just remember like laughing at the time or like you know kind of um finding it quite comedic how stretched out he was letting it go you know and then it kicks in with the ramstein and it like mm. it just uh, that always brings a smile to me because i just think that's a that piece of music works so well for it for some crazy reason with the mm. um you know the, the beginning and the end of this this volume i can't remember if it's in volume two or not but um but yeah like but th then from there on like it becomes like such a um for me, a like, like hypnotic, like hypnotically mundane film, where even though the subject matter is quite bombastic, which I think is kind of maybe what he's going for. Like it's it's quite a you know like you talked about the campaign, the, the you know the marketing and things like that. It seems like quite um, an extreme film, or you know the, con the, the subject matter seems quite um, well, I guess sexy, right? You know, like something that's kind of um, there to maybe titillate. But I, th I feel like the actual content of the film and the way it's presented, at least, sorry, is um, is so um, like calm and reserved, and the way that um, like Charlotte Gainsbourg's like um, her, her voice is just so soft and kind of almost like whispering, and and it's the same with um, Stella Skarsgård. Um, the, I, I remember thinking that when he, when he first brings her into the room, um, you know, and brings her the cup of tea, it's almost like they're whispering to each other. You know, we've just come out of that the the rock and Ramstein, you know, right. into like into like them whispering when she's on the, the ground and stuff like that, and you can barely hear them. Um, and yeah, I just I I don't know. I find this I can see why this would be a film that you you would have repeat watched because I think it's something like once you're in, you're just kind of in, and it just kind of carries you along, mm -hmm. in little kind of waves of. Um, of, of like story and then it kind of takes little side side winds you know with um with Skarsgård's character talking about the fishing and stuff like that and again that just 
kept making me laugh and kind of like how kind of uh, you know irrelevant and irreverent uh, uh, his stories are but they, they, you know they, they seem to tie in and I'm always waiting for like um, the Joe character to get just like really pissed off with him like mm. I'm trying to tell you a story <laughs> what the fuck's going on um, but it just it just keeps going and it's that kind of rambly you know that way um, mm. and I love the kind of you know the fact that it's like little vignettes and little stories and the way that he plays with imagery and stuff um, and the repetition and then jumping to other um, like usually the stock footage from from for example um some some of the stories that the the, the what's the character what's the character's name? Seligman. Seligman's stories, you know, like cuts back and forth. I just think it's so well done, and right up to the end of this volume, um, and I, I kind of for, for some the the, climb, the the end of this volume, I, I I hadn't quite placed was there. I wasn't sure if that was in part two or not. Um, you know, the kind of story beat, um, and then it kicks back in with the music, and I was like, oh man, I I I just wanted to watch volume two right but right, it, right. It late at night i had to go to bed so i was like right i'll just have to i'll just wait like i said i was gonna wait right um, <laughs> but yeah like, it's, 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 a, it's a really weird film for me it's like, i find it i guess that, yeah it definitely is messy but i don't know something just hypnotic about it for me mm. like, just kind of i think it's that the waves of like kind of it, it you know waves and crests a little bit where it, it, it carries you on to the next uh, next story beat and then it kind of slows down to the point where you're almost like not checking out, but you're almost kind of like, okay, I'm a wee bit kind of, you know, I, I've got the point. What's mm. the next thing? And then it just kind of switches lanes. You know, yeah. What's, you know, and you get a different kind of part of the story, you know, from him or her. Um, but yeah, I, 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 so far I'm just like, I, I feel like I had a similar experience the first time um, to you, whereby I was a little bit disappointed maybe. But I think knowing what I was getting for this time, I, um, I've been kind of ready for it. And it's mm-hmm. really, I don't know, it's, it's a weirdly, it's weird to say that it's an exciting film, given that it's so, um, so you know, plodding and mm. pacing sometimes and, and the stories. But I don't know, I just really love the little vignettes. It's almost like, you know, th- I don't know how many, like four or five different short films in one, you know. Mm. Really, I, I've really enjoyed it so far. Yeah. I think one of the problems that, um, I still have with it to an extent is the fact that we have this mass of length, but we st- I still feel that Joe is quite an impenetrable character. Mm. She's quite cold, um, and I think I was always looking for more characterization in a sense, just to get a handle on her. Because, but I think that's in- it's intentionally not done that way because I don't think that that's something that Von Trier is interested in. Uh, at all um because i feel like joe is basically a cipher for him mm. um okay. i think he's done that throughout his career uh, his films i think with this one's probably his most personal film i feel like he's portraying his depression onto his main characters and i think in this one you, you do see more and more um of uh, events controversial events that have happened with von trier uh, played out uh, in this one um, but um, yeah I think the director's cut does give us a bit more context more so in part two I think um, but it fleshes out Joe's character a little bit more um, but um, one of the differences with Nymphomaniac compared to his, most of his previous works is that um, with Joe we get a very unsympathetic um, heroine, whereas usually we have a very likable, sympathetic heroine who's normally the victim. Um, for instance, Selma and in, uh, Dancing in the Dark, um, uh, Justine and Melancholia. Um, so they're normally the kind of naive idealist, is the kind of trope that he normally works with, who no one quite believes, but then they're sort of vindicated at the end. The heroine in this character is actually the victimizer. Mm-hmm. Um, in a sense, even though you could say she's a victim of her nymphomania, but the way that Joe portrays the story is that she's a bad person and she's the one that's doing evil deeds uh, to other people. So I think that's part of the reason why there's a sort of difference with this one that's maybe as an audience member, you can't quite um, you know, sympathize with the main character, um, which 
maybe is one of the things that makes it less successful. But um, saying that, as I was saying, that that's not really important to one tree. He's not trying to create realistic characters. He's just trying to take philosophical ideas and sort of he's just using the character as a kind of a coat rack to hang the ideas. He's more interested in exploring the, the ideas between Seligman and Joe rather than creating a realistic narrative. Um, but I think it's also curious to think about um, how much do we view Joe as a trustworthy tr- trustworthy narrator? Because yeah, yeah. the film plays with that idea that, um, and Seligman yeah. says this, that your stories are unbelievable. I love yeah. I love, that. I love that scene so much. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly Shia LaBeouf's there and Seligman just, because I'm thinking, you're thinking it yourself, you're like, mm. no, 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 no. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> and and Seligman literally says that, says, this is not, this is unreal. No. <laughs> Aye. Yeah. Um, so you're right. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Aye. But yeah, um, I think that adds to the, the way the stories are recounted gives it a mundane, the word you use is a good word that occurred to me as well, that it's, a very, it's very much more uh, kind of flat in terms of like melancholy and Antichrist have a quite operatic kind of, the tension is very high, mm-hmm. uh, the way the story is told, whereas this is just like flat. And it's just like kind of grimy. It's got a grimy, a grimy vibe, um, which I think is what is good. Although it did occur to me, I wonder. I would like to see a, a version of the film that's just them in the flat. Because okay. uh, I think yeah. that's my favourite bit. Because that that the, the aesthetic there is so uh, kind of disgusting, and yeah. uh, that's kind of what I wanted, what I envisioned the film might be. Like, it's Von Trier doing his most grimy, kind of uh, disgusting work. But the the way the, the flashbacks work, we get a, a, a sort of variety of visual styles. Um, so I, that would have been curious. Maybe I would have preferred if it was just them in the flat. But uh, um, that would have been nice to see. Yeah. Um, what did you think of, like... Um some of the performances, I remember the some of the form performances like rubbing me a little bit the wrong way the first time around. Um, like, like Sh- Shia LaBeouf, I thought he was okay this time. I didn't really it didn't really stick out for me. Um, Christian Slater as Joe's father, I thought I still don't quite can't quite place his accent. I feel like I don't know. To me, it's just Christian Slater. I don't know for some reason he's just really ingrained in my. Nostalgia brain or something like that, so like I can't really buy him as anything. Mm. I don't know. Uh, in this, um, and Uma Thurman as well. I mean, that scene is like that takes like the kind of um, like the emotionless or the coldness of Joe to another level. Really, that's the whole scene when she comes in with her husband and stuff like that. Um, but, but did, what about you? I mean, other, like other. I mean, the, the main the main characters, um, Charlotte Gainsbourg and uh, Stan Skarsgård, and I think I think. Um, so Stacy, what's her? What's her? Stacy Martin. Yes, I think mm. she does a really good job as um, approximating. Yeah. The Joe character, like you know, very much in line with how we see her currently, you know, in mm. day. Um, but what about the the kind of rest of the cast? What were your thoughts on those? Yeah. Um. All good. I think. Yeah. It's it's a it's a kind of mixed bag, especially the um the accents and stuff is all over the place. But that doesn't really bother me. Um. But. Yeah, he's bringing people to the film that I think people have pre-existing expectations of. Yeah. Um, so I think I think Slater's good. Um, I don't think there's anything, there's nothing wrong with him. It just for some reason it takes me a, a little bit. Right, away. right. I mean, and I know most of these other actors as well. It's just for some reason with him, it just it just t- takes me out a little, right. a little bit. But I, I still I still think the the you know, the black and white story, the the, the delirium chapter mm. is. Is really strong, mm. and, and part of that is, you know, it's a big part of because of him. So, um, but yeah, I don't know why. It's, yeah, just it could, just kind of like, oh, that's Christian Slater. Right, okay. <laughs> it just hits me. Yeah, Labouf, I quite like in this as well. I think he does I does well. Yeah, I, I, really did. I don't. I think because right. he went so kind of crazy mm. in real life. Like since Aye. this point, it's like, oh, this is him actually <laughs> acting again. You know, it's mm-hmm. like that in between. You know the kind of Transformers, Indiana Jones, and then what what he did later on. You know it's kind of that kind of transition point almost. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, I thought he was really good in that as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, one thing that Von Trier does in this film that he'd kind of got away from was like, this seems to me like his most blatantly, well, intentionally funny film. Like, he seems to yeah. place the jokes a lot more prominently and intentionally. Um, his stuff has always had quite a kind of black sense of humour. And he, he's always made kind of, you know, the famous one was the bells at the end of Breaking the Waves, which everyone was like, oh, no. Like, he does these kind of, like, cringy, kind of, occasionally, like, funny moments, where I think are, like, funny to him. And, like, he just kind of likes, kind of, pissing off the audience a wee bit sometimes. <laughs> but I feel yeah. like he got away from that. Uh, like, Antichrist and Melancholia, I think, are, like, serious Vontria. They're like his most dark, his most kind of, um, right, I'm making serious work here. Whereas, and this he seems to bring back the comedy, um, which is not my favourite aspect of his filmmaking. Um, but he does push that to the fore a bit more. And I remember when we saw it, that it was getting big laughs right. in the cinema. So um, that's something notable about this film that wasn't really my cup of tea, but um, we watching it. I, th I think it's it's part of the movie, um, and it's just a sort of change in style for him um, a wee bit. But um, I think it works for this film because even though the subject matter is still quite dark and kind of traumatic, it's played quite quite coldly. So I think it kind of gives it something. Yeah, you know, um, because I don't know. It maybe stops you thinking about you know. It, you know, it takes away from the coldness of the character, you know, the, 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 of the character of Joel and the way she's just presenting things very matter of fact that the comedy kind of like gives it something else. I think so. I think it works here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, 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 I quite liked that the first time and it definitely it was something I was looking forward to watching. Right. You know? do you, uh, how do you, do you prefer the, the series uh, Antichrist Melancholia or the more kind of playful Von Trier here. I appreciate both. Aye, I can, yeah. in, this, I th in this, I think it works for this film. I don't think it would have worked in Melancholia. Yeah. Or I'll always film. love, like, there's always usually laugh out loud moments in the Von Trier films, but I think I prefer them when they come from just the dialogue and it's not an obvious joke. One the bit I laughed out loud uh, is, I think, when the scene where Joe becomes a secretary and she's putting the pastry and tea. Uh, I love that scene. And then um, Jerome, Shia character character's like, where the fuck is my cake fork? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that but well, like, some of the more it's obvious it's jokes with Seligman, I'm like, right. roll my eyes a wee bit. At, but, right, right. Uh, yeah, I, I get, yeah, I think it's because, I think I like them because they're so absurd. Mm. Uh, that kind of humour kind of, you know, when it's like, it's, it's almost like, it's like, yeah, I suppose it's like one tree are doing dad jokes. <laughs> you know, this kind of tickles me a little bit uh, mm. because I think because the film is, even though it's not, I wouldn't say it's you know it's, the subject matter isn't treated as I say as darkly. Um, it's quite a still a a, a start. Um, not stark. What's the word I'm looking for? It's you know what's the word? I, was, I had the word. It's still a kind of bleak film. You know, it's it's, it's it doesn't there's not much humanity in it. So I think that's what the Stellan character brings to it mm. is like some humanity. Yeah, and, you know, and, and it works in the film because that seems to be what you know, or, or it's him trying to bring that to Joe, who seems yeah. to have no humanity left at this point. Uh, although seeing her from previously, we, it doesn't look like she had load, loads <laughs> um, to start with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so her character's quite consistent that way. Um, but also, we we're presented at the beginning with, um, you know, Joe's been attacked in some fashion. Right. Mm. Um, and that's where Stelligman finds her. Um, sorry, Stelligman. Um, and she kind of essentially says she deserves it. And she's a, an evil human being or a bad mm. human being. Um, and it's kind of him trying to, well, I guess, try to comfort her and, and find out what she means by that. And that's what then leads to the the kind of her a uh, justifying the statement with telling her how all these te or a series of terrible things are yeah. done in, in in her life. Um, so it's kind of interesting as I say to like uh, no, I, I know 
I do know the the, the volume two, obviously, but it's been a while since I watched it. But it is quite interesting seeing the character, like who still seems to be quite cold, um, but apparently reaching some sort of point where she ha- is judging herself now on on what she's done. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's kind of weird that she's not necessarily hysterical about it, or you know, she's she's just very matter of fact, like. Um, which almost kind of you wonder is it like it's one of those things is she just is she is she pretending she's human you know that way like, is she kind of like is it just a kind of I, I guess I must be um, evil or a bad person yeah um, because she's not really showing any emotion about it necessarily or or kind of regret that you mm. would see um, but yeah I, I, see, I think the, the kind of the framing that you're right the framing um, story them in the apartment you know is definitely the most interesting or you know, engaging part of the story. That, that's yeah, the part that I'll, I always want to get back to and get to like you know sure. what's the next uh, <laughs> fishing analogy. Uh, yeah, I want to say as well, like talking about the the style and the form. Like I'm a huge fan of Von Trier cinematography. Mm. I love the kind of rough handheld that he does. Um, I think that's a perfect complement to his quite quite grand kind of philosophical political ideas that he's always exploring but you have this contrast with the roughness um of the digital handheld and um you know, normally his style that he developed through from like the second part of his career was like have the actors uh, play the scenes out and then he would shoot them just from like a variety of angles and then he would just like cut them together like just mm. even like smashing them up with jump cuts and right breaking the axis and i just love that the style that he has um um i think um it just it's just uh works really well mm. um, it, it kind of um he jumps around a little bit with style in this right in this film i feel like the um the mr h mrs h section mm-hmm. definitely has more of that feel to it right where it's like um it's kind of the opening to melancholia like where you know there's a lot of kind of um not lots of jump cuts, but definitely what you're talking about there. But then there's other parts like that I feel are a bit more, um, just a different style, like that feel a bit more grand or a bit more artistic. Mm-hmm. And again, that are present in Melancholia as well. Um, but I feel like he tries to come up with not necessarily a unique style for each of the chapters, but definitely it's it, they, they feel different from each other. Right, I like they, they kind of they definitely have a different like visual tone to them. Okay, um, you know, besides just the clear, like, you know, oh, this one's in black and white, right? Like, you know, I f- there's definitely kind of I feel the the, the the flashback when the girls on the train feels quite punky and quite seventies looking almost, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then like we get the kind of a uh, more arty like stuff with her parents and like, the beginning with when she's younger and stuff. Um, so I quite appreciate that. It keeps the the, the film really visually interesting mm-hmm. over and above what it usually does, even as well. I think. Yeah. Um. Yeah, as I recall, he, he maybe he lets the scenes play a bit longer in terms of the takes in part one, at least. As I recall from maybe Antichrist, that's got more jump cuts in it and stuff like that, but I've not seen it in a while, so that's kind of just anecdotal. But it feels like this has got a bit more... Um, uh, it's got a bit more length to it. It's a bit more spacious in terms of the, how the, the story plays. It's not quite as chaotic as maybe it's the editing in some of his uh, previous films. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it still works Works great. Definitely, yeah. Um, all right, Guy, well, I mean, I don't know if you want to have, a, if you've got any final thoughts on this volume. Um, oh, I guess, did, how do you feel that it, does it hold up as a film on its own, volume one? Hmm, that's an interesting when because the length obviously suggests yes that you probably wouldn't watch the whole thing in one go mm-hmm. that i think the it's an interesting film that you can just dip into and watch wee bits um so in a sense that it, it feels like half a story but at the same time the the length of it would sort of um allow you to to take take it in uh, one half at a time yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting. I think the chapters helps make you feel, feel that you can jump in, kind of. Like, yeah. And stuff. But yeah, I, I think ultimately it, it doesn't work for me as a single film, but as a you know, 
is like a part one with the you know a sequel to follow. It mm. really well, I think. Yeah, it kind of maybe feels like it could even be like a TV series mm. or like uh, rather than a movie because mm. it, it, it is episodic and it's just as I was saying quite linear and we're, we're not really one part doesn't really build on the other in a sense it's just kind of meandering and rambles along. <laughs> yeah, and, and even so. when you go to the credits and we get the the throw forward to part two, Aye. it's very similar to the next time on. Yeah, you know? could be like a four part mini series or something. Yeah. Cool. Well, I guess we'll, we'll have to see what happens in so I'll do it. Yeah, so that will do it for our, our discussion of part one. Please return to see how what we think of Nymphomaniac Director's Cut part two. So you've been watching Cinema Subculture. If you've enjoyed this episode, please make sure you have subscribed on YouTube, like the video and hit the notification bell. Thanks for watching. I've been Simon. I've been Gary. Keep it extreme.